Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Brother Tobit's Mystery. This will be part 365. Now, our lesson title today is The Life Promised Versus the Life Lived. I want to take a look at the promises, and then we want to take a look at the second half of this. Scripture teaches, the Lord promised all who would believe in him and follow him eternal life. Gospel of John, 10th chapter, verse 22, uh, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, the <clears throat> problem that we find basically is the comprehension of the term eternal life. What? does eternal life compose uh, of what is the significance what differentiates eternal life from temporal life we want to take a look at uh, the main motive the main source of eternal life Jesus says I give them eternal life how does it happen how does he do it well, <clears throat> Scripture teaches eternal life resides in the Holy Spirit, which comes to indwell the saint at the time of the new birth experience. 1 John, 4th chapter, verse 13. Epistle of John, 1 John, 4th chapter, verse 13. How do you know you have eternal life? And how do you know you're living eternal life? <clears throat> Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he hath given us of his spirit. <clears throat> Within the spirit eternal life is experienced. Scripture teaches the first thing that the Spirit does is to translate the saint into the reality called the kingdom of God, the reality of life. <clears throat> so what we find, <clears throat> the Scripture tells us we can experience eternal life once we are translated into the reality called the kingdom of God. Turn to Colossians, the first chapter, verse 12 to 13. <clears throat> We're looking at the process of what the Bible tells us, what the scripture is telling us, necessitate an entrance into eternal life. It has to come through the Holy Spirit. It has to be imparted by the Holy Spirit in translating the spirit of the saint from one reality into another reality. Colossians, the first chapter, verses 12 to 13. <clears throat> it 
giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. So we find two things here. Eternal life is differentiated from temporal life by the fact that the physical does not experience eternal life. The spiritual part of man experiences eternal life. Most people try to experience eternal life from a physical perspective. can't be done. Because <clears throat> eternal life is only manifested through the spirit of the individual. Yes? When you say they try to experience eternal life through the physical, what are they thinking to believe that they can do so? That life is going to become better. Because now they're in Christ. So they're looking through the senses and trying to gauge their experience in terms of a physical experience. Even though they're still within the temporal existence? Are you saying that they don't recognize it? No. No, no they don't recognize it. They don't recognize right. it. They don't have the ability, if they're looking physically, they can't recognize it because the scripture we just read tells us everything has to be done on a spiritual level. Your physical is not geared to the spiritual. Your physical is geared to the physical. Your eyes, your ears are all primed to give you detecting, detecting the things of the physical realm. Mr. Smith. Okay. <clears throat> give it thanks unto the Father, with, which hath made us meet or fit to be partakers of the inheritance and the saints in light. So now, if he has translated us, did he just translate you or did we put ourselves in the receivable or we, we desired to be or is it part of the born again experience? It is the born again experience. Okay. So in order to go through the born again experience, you have to seek it and ask for, and, then, and then go sure. through the, the... So if you haven't gone through that, then this is just words to you. Well, we said at the beginning, <clears throat> the promises. How do you get eternal life? It starts with accepting Jesus as personal Savior. So that's a prerequisite. From there on, we're looking at the mechanics of it. What happens to you? The Spirit is imparted to you so you can experience eternal life. But from the born again experience, we are instantly brought up. We're a new creation. So from that point henceforth, is, it's a focus on the spiritual and not the physical. We have to get done thinking about our physical existence here because we're heading for immortality we're heading for divinity and spending a bunch of time thinking about the human experience is a waste of time concerning god yes but most people don't know that who teaches them that you <laughs> that should be taught in the seminaries it should be preached from the pulpits it's not People are living and thinking they're living eternal life in their physical existence. I could, you know, imagine, Mr. Jones, because my, my own personal experience is you can't ask an average Christian, can you tell me the difference between a Christian and a born again Christian? What? They're both Christians, so what were we doing? No, there's no, there is no. Christian if he's not born again. But see, that's the, that's the fallacy. It's not taught. So if you've never gone through the born again experience, you're not Christian. Exactly. Which leaves out 80% of people that confess Christianity. They're not taught. They're taught from Must a be religious born. perspective. You come, you're a Christian. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, they will tell you I'm a Baptist, I'm a Methodist. I'm a Presbyterian. I said, well, you're a Christian. Yes, I'm a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. I'm a Presbyterian. I'm a Catholic. They are taught to look at their Christianity through the crucible of their denomination. If they were taught the, the principles we just read, 
Organized religion would crumble. Yeah. Couldn't stand the test. So then it's kind of what we call the leadership, well, what actually is the leadership of the church, they're taught how to run the business. That's all it is. They're not taught to ask, to seek, to not, to, to grow, to stretch. These, these concepts don't come into it at all. They're strictly, is the business, say you get your money, say a, a Hail Mary every now and then, and you get, that's it. You would wipe out the mega church. You would wipe out Catholicism. You would wipe out most of the mainline denominational teaching. Greg Laurie, I believe Joyce Myers, and uh, who's the uh, Ken Copper, but the other guy that locked his, the, the church doors when the oh, oh Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen, yes. Not that I watch them, but they don't talk about being born again. No. No. Now, now, well, there's a salvation message, but the, the, the meaning of the whole thing is not explained as to what is happening. It's, it's in general terminology. It's not, it's not taught. It's spoke of. But it's, 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 it's substance without with any, no meaning. Sure. And, and then they do it purposely. I'm going to ask you a question. The people that are teaching all this, are they born again? I'm coming more and more to the conclusion, I've got to tell you how shocked I was when I began to have this conclusion. I don't think they are. No. no. That's why they can't teach it. I assumed, and see, that's the humor in me. Any person who's teaching has to be born again. Has to be. And then I began to comprehend, this is not born again behavior. And they can't ask, answer any questions, well not that any questions are asked, but they can't answer any questions. They don't talk about anything exactly. They put all their concepts in terms of the physical. Exactly. When they talk about blessings, you are programmed to see your life in terms of a Cadillac, a house, an increase in your job, uh, salary, uh, an upgrade in uh, <clears throat> new things coming into your life physically because they don't have a comprehension of the spiritual reality of the born again experience. It says all things become new. Well, no they're not. I don't see anything new. What's new? So there's no explanation of what, what what's that principle by? If all things become new, how come I don't see anything new? Because it's spiritual, Mr. Jones, and, and it's not. So people are not taught to ditch this, this physical existence as being important because we're heading for eternal life, which is not physical. Not taught. Uh, they're taught to stay on earth perpetually. Turn to 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. <clears throat> Everything you see in organized religion is taught in terms of the physical life, which is not touched in the born again experience. You do not experience anything in the physical <clears throat> when you're born again. You may experience emotion, but that's emotion. That's not your spirit being regenerated, that you're feeling emotion. 2 Corinthians 5th chapter, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, how do you think people interpret this scripture? That they will get a new life with many blessings. Like he says, if you say he's fine, you get outside the world. New life to them means an easier life. It means... Oh, okay, I've gone through all the hardship now. Now things are going to be, because I'm in Christ, and he's promised me all these blessings, I can expect to have an upgrade in my physical existence. The mega church leadership capitalizes on that. Look for your miracle. God is bringing you forth now. He's favoring you. He wants you to have the best. On and on and on and on and on. 
and the majority of people swallow that hook, line, and sinker because nowhere are they taught to look at their life from a spiritual perspective. So you understand that the first reason that these saints are referring to get offended is because they're not receiving material wealth. Certainly. Certainly. And therefore, Christ can't be real, he doesn't love me, or whatever. Well, no, no, they're kind into thinking, oh, no, it's not that, it's somehow they are not performing. Okay. You don't have enough faith, brother. Uh, you're not giving enough tithes, brother. You want that blessing. You've been born again. You accepted the Lord, but you're failing to allow the promises to come into your life because you're lacking somewhere. These people aren't going to let them go that easy. I you're talking about leadership. Yes. I yes. Was referring to the, the congregation. Yes. <clears throat> They're going to browbeat them into a guilt trip in which they feel somehow they're failing because it should be happening. I have, should have all things new. It's not happening. Well, it's because you don't have enough faith. You're not doing this. You're not committed enough to the church. Okay. Precisely what I was about to say, Mr. Jones. See, with this born-again experience, God's Word says it. We either believe it or we don't. So now, if you believe it, now, but you don't see these manifestations of anything new, then if God's Word says it and I believe it, then I must go forward in faith believing that God's word is true and it says we are renewed daily in the scriptures we are renewed daily so we have to know that God's word is not fallible he's speaking the truth we need to learn to trust it implicitly don't question it because you don't understand it but he's not done with you yet either so the, the thing is, is the spiritual awareness of the born again experience is, is the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, wisdom and revelation. The thing is, is you've got to go beyond the here and now into the spiritual realm by faith. If we're if renewed every day, that means I'm being renewed even though I don't feel like it, I don't look like it, but the Word is saying I am. So by faith, I believe that. And as God sees you operating in faith, faith without works is dead faith. There's no faith. So if you don't step out in faith believing, giving God a chance to prove himself to you because he will find the way you need personally to reveal himself to you. And so it just it's not being taught, Mr. Jones, except for here with you. Well, the idea is <clears throat> it's being taught, but it's being distorted. Everything you say is taught, but they're taught to see it in the physical not in the spiritual and the way that the human mind operates in the physical is always one way works i got to do more i got to do better works and the leadership capitalizes off of that they talk about faith well to the mind of the individual faith means you got to do something not that you got to believe something and doing something in the in the catholic realm you got to do better works, more works. You're sinning, and you 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 come out of your sin through a work. Do a hail Mary. Uh, uh, have um, <clears throat> a, a ten acts of contrition. Do this. You got to do something. Everybody in organized religion, whether Protestant or Catholic, leadership programs the individual to think bettering his life has come through works. You see the. Jesse Duplantis. I got all this millions of dollars here. The Lord's blessed, 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 blessed. Ken Copeland, got a new jet. <clears throat> Creflo Dollar. All these guys, what are they doing to show that they are successful Christians? Physical blessings. And people look at that and they say, I got to do that. I got to do that. Well, how do you do it? You support the man that's receiving all this. It's a con job. I spoke to somebody who we noticed the other day. She determined that her life isn't going well because she picked up the bulletin. She didn't see her name in the list of people to pray for. There's only so much room. And therefore, that's why her life is not going well because the church has been praying for her. 
Actually, I said that uh, if you came to church a bit more, the church would remember it. <laughs> <laughs> I could resist that. Right. But the, the point I'm making is that people now are looking for, even though they've got the knowledge, she's born again. Mm -hmm. She understands what um, mm -hmm. race is saying. She understands these concepts, mm -hmm. but she doesn't want to understand. And so, of course, you hide it in all of that. Yeah, because the mind is still centered on organized religion, the way they interpret scripture. She wants to become known in everybody's mind to feel sorry for her. Yeah, and exactly right. So she becomes somebody mm -hmm. by, by doing it that way. <coughs> Absolutely correct. But let's go on. So we, we establish <coughs> a principle here that the new birth has nothing to do with the physical realm. It has to do with the spiritual realm. Eternal life is not going to be experienced sensorily. It's going to be experienced spiritually. The person has to learn to come to terms with the fact that he is not a physical being in a physical world. He is a spiritual being in a physical world. <clears throat> Christians are taught to identify with their physical, never with their spiritual. <clears throat> so therefore, things that are taking place on the inside are never allowed to mature, to grow. They are shut off. If a person becomes anointed with the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak in tongues or they begin to exhibit a spiritual manifestation immediately it's browbeat they made the believe that uh, somehow they're acting erratically shut it down conform to everything else that's being brought back about in the physical realm henceforth you cannot have the spirit manifests the things that the Bible talks about in the midst of God's people because the mindset won't allow it. Instead of unity, harmony, you're going to get division. Instead of spirituality, you're going to get carnality because this is what people are programmed to function in. But let's go on. <clears throat> Scripture teaches the indwelling Holy Spirit is in constant contact with the Father. The Father directs the Spirit to lead the saint on the Father's preordained path of experiences. As soon as the born again experience takes place in the life, spiritually, God sets that person on a path of development that leads into eternity. Immediately, we're going to see an example of that. Turn to <coughs> Matthew, third, third chapter, verses 16 to 17. Matthew, third chapter, 16 to Jesus baptism <clears throat> and Jesus when he was baptized went up straightway out of the water and lo the heavens were open unto him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him so he's setting the example of what happens <clears throat> to the rest of us in the born-again experience the Spirit indwells the individual he's born again and then he's completed in what's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He gets the power to live the mandates of the Christ life. At this point, Jesus is experiencing the baptism, the power of the Holy Spirit coming down and resting upon him to guide him, strengthen him, and lead him on the path that the Father ordained for him to walk. Notice what the next passage of scripture says verse 17 and then lo a voice from heaven 
saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So immediately, this is giving you a principle. When you experience the new birth, immediately the Father sets in motion your path. The Holy Spirit is in you to guide you if you become obedient to his direction. Note what the first thing happens after this. Turn to <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 1. Matthew 4, verse 1. Then, then, in other words, immediately, was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He immediately set on the path the Father ordained for him to experience those things he would need in his ministry. The testing immediately started in his as soon as the Spirit came on him, it directed him, this is what you need to do. This is true of every single saint that experiences the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Not the new birth. The new birth gives you eternal life. The baptism gives you the ability to walk the life. And that will be, uh, capability to overcome. And to overcome. You're set on the path. Most times in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, it happened almost simultaneously. They accepted the Lord, baptism came on them, they got water baptized, and they were ready to go. Paul, one of his ministries, laying hands on the saint <clears throat> that had been born again so he could get the Holy Spirit, so he could begin the path that the Father had destined for him to walk. Notice what Paul says, Ephesians, second chapter. He's talking to a baby Christian. <clears throat> baby Christians, the church at Ephesus. Ephesians, the first chapter. <clears throat> Starting in verse 15. <laughs> Ephesians 1.15 <clears throat> Wherefore, <clears throat> I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. Paul is talking about after I heard of your new birth. I know that the Holy Spirit now indwells you. You have received the earnest of the Spirit. After I heard that, Paul says, verse 16, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that, 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 the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, <clears throat> may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. It's the baptism, which <clears throat> exactly the same way that it happened to Jesus, Paul the saying it should happen to you. Jesus experienced the baptism. The Father proclaimed his pleasure. Immediately, the Holy Spirit directed him on the path the Father had ordained. Paul is saying he can't be with them at this point to lay hands on them. <clears throat> so he's praying that it will happen to them, that the Father will direct it to take place in their life. It's not optional. It's mandatory. It's part of the new birth experience. Yes. How is it that we can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our lives? How is it? Yeah. <clears throat> By expecting it. It's going to happen. Because the <laughs> Jesus said, you receive the promise of my Father. 
He promised if you're born again, you're going to get filled with my spirit. So what most Christians, it's just a question of time, but they are not taught to expect it. Rather, they're taught just the opposite. Every mainline denomination will give you a salvation message and then tell you you don't need anything else. That's satanic. No, it's not funny. It's satanic. Because you're taking the word of God, which we just read, and you're making it nothing. You're neutralizing it in the mind of the individual that needs it above everything else. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you can't walk the path God's ordained for you to walk. You don't have the power to overcome the things that you've got to deal with. And when you end your life, you're not going to qualify for anything, any position in God's kingdom, because you haven't, you haven't overcome to qualify to receive it. You've been conned out of your eternal inheritance. Through lack of knowledge. Yes. So the question has to be, to what degree is a person who has not been taught, to what degree is that person required to seek, ask, and knock? There has to be more to this. He's going to be held responsible. That's the point I make. He's, he's going to be held responsible, but the people you see don't entertain that because they are taught by the person that's got the little paper that they have everything they need. Now what you need to do is you think in terms of your denomination. How can I serve my denomination? Not how can you serve Christ as a disciple? How can you serve your church? Yes, sir. What if we did it just like Paul did it? What's that? Prayed for somebody to receive it. Sure, that's what we're supposed to do. Or lay hands on them that they might receive it. But they have to want it, don't they? Exactly. Yes. And my question to you, young lady, is would you like to undergo that experience? I've already had it. Amen. 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 <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Many years ago. So have I. So have I. I just wanted to make sure, and thank you for that, young lady. <laughs> but yes. It's been since being part of this group that I've learned to use it. And I you know what? I'm going to tell you right now. The scripture says, you know them by their fruits. I'm a fruit inspector. You got two thumbs up. Every single one of us who come through that same experience. In other words, we come alive and we understood what we're doing. But that's it. Continue. And I don't know if I should say this or not, but that mm -hmm. scripture you had a couple minutes ago, mm -hmm. Colossians. Mm -hmm. Colossians 1. <coughs> Say again. <coughs> Colossians 1, 13. 12 and 13. 12 and 13. Yes. Giving thanks to the Father which hath made us meet or fit to be partakers no. of the inheritance. Not the other one was who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I what was the gist of? That's what I'm trying to think. But you said that after you said the scripture that people seem to get taught that now that they've accepted the Lord and they're born again, they should expect things from the Lord like wealth. Well, yeah, I was saying that they're looking stuff. at a physical betterment rather than a but spiritual. I was never taught that. I was taught that when you accepted the Lord, I mean, I, in fact, I don't even know that I was taught this, but things change. You look at life differently. You look at a tree. Now it's beautiful. Where before it was just a tree. Things change in your mind. And but then people, you want to serve him more because of this new. That's what I... But see. people don't understand why you see things differently. They're looking at it from a spirit, from a physical perspective. Oh, I didn't used to do that before. Now I don't do it. They're thinking intellectually. They're not identifying that the spirit inside of them is manifesting the change to the physical. 
they're looking in their mind, I used to do this, I don't do it anymore. I don't associate with the world anymore. I don't do this, I don't do that from a physical perspective. And that's dangerous. Why? Because you can be taught, you can be tricked right out of that by a false teacher telling you, oh yes, yeah, since you do that, now this is what we do. And be leading you into a path which will totally neutralize your spirit's growth. What I'm saying here, that the scripture is telling us you have to guard your spirit. Because if you don't understand that your change comes spiritually, you're going to depend upon some man to lead you physically on a greater and greater understanding of Christ. Most Christians live a life in which a man is the center of their belief system. My pastor, my teacher, not the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask you a question. In your memory, how many times have you been encouraged to trust the Spirit within you rather than what the man is saying? How many times have you been encouraged to test what that man says? Now, on that note, I'm going to give you an understanding. Jesus tells us, for that reason, the majority of the body of Christ is going to lose out. Turn to Matthew, 24th chapter. Matthew 24. Jesus foretold that at the time of the end of the age, most Christians would be living a life that is not the spiritual promised life but the old life. They'd be believing that they're living a spiritual life but they're actually living the old carnal life. Matthew 24 verse 4 to 5. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. I'm going to say it again. This is in response to people saying, What is going to be the sign of your coming? The first thing Jesus says is, Take heed that no man deceive you. Why? For, because, many shall come in my name. Not a few, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. He's talking about people that come proclaiming him to be the Messiah. People coming proclaiming him to be the Savior, Lord and Savior, which is true. He said, many will come declaring me to be who I am. But notice what he goes on to say. And shall deceive, and shall deceive many, many. He's talking about the majority of the body of Christ is going to be in deception in the days in which he's going to return. Well, if you take a look at organized religion, and I'm just going to pose this question to you. From the things that you've heard us speak about here, how many people can you talk to where you have come from your church about the things we talk. Now, I'm not saying that you have to try to shove it down anybody's throat. <coughs> what I'm saying is how much of a conversation can you have discussing what you have been taught, what you have learned here? Not a good far. Why? Why is that? Because they think they know it all and they don't want to learn anything new. <laughs> I rest my case. We're not saying that everything we say you have to automatically just take without questioning it, without researching it. All we're saying is for our brothers and sisters 
an organized religion to sit down with us and discuss the scripture. Is it true? And if it's not true, you point it out to us scripturally. If you can't point it out to us scripturally, that means you can't find fault with it. Go ahead. Don't you have to be hungry for that? To want to I'm talking about the leadership. Well, even them, wouldn't they have to be hungry for that? No. They don't have to be hungry. They have to act as custodians over the word of God. That's why they're in positions of leadership. They are to test all things. They're supposed to protect God's people so they don't come under false teaching. It's mandatory that they review doctrine and give a, 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 a response to Paul talks about that. Paul spent all his time speaking to other people about the doctrine of Christ. The first thing he would do when he would go into community is declare the gospel and then his reasons for Christ being the Messiah. Remember, Paul was a Jew and most Jews had rejected Jesus. And Paul would go into a synagogue and he would seek out the, the leader of the synagogue and put down the scroll of Isaiah and show him where in Isaiah it says that the Messiah is Jesus Christ. And that man would be uh, uh, um, he, he would be forced to give Paul an account. Either he believed it or he didn't believe it. And most of them didn't believe it, not because they, they showed what Paul was saying was untrue, but because of their twisted, distorted view that they had of the scripture, they would not accept it. We have the same mantle. We go and we, we none of the things we teach here is something we've cobbled up. Everything we teach here comes from the word of God. And all we say is, consider what, what we're offering here. Do you consider it true? If not, why not? And we have never, we've been doing this for 30 some odd years, we have never got one person to dispute scripturally what we teach. All they will do is try to character assassinate us, say we're teaching cult uh, doctrine, but they will never t uh, point out why it's wrong, why it's erroneous from a scriptural perspective. Matter of fact, we find that basically people feel threatened when we present these principles. Now why should that be? If you have the truth, you should be confident in what you believe in. Most people will avoid us. And that's just, that's just the experiences that we have. Mr. Smith. Most people will avoid us because being human is the most important thing in their lives. We're teaching is got to die to the human personality and go to the spiritual personality, fashion out light. And that just is you're, you're it's, that's a, that's too far. You can't go that far. That's right. We've had people we used to teach in this, this Sunday school class here. We've had one person look at a scripture and deny what he read. He literally walked out and said, that's not true, it's not true, it's not true. But he never, he never disproved that why it isn't true. I rest my case. Jesus said, by the time of his coming, or the end of the age, most Christians would be in a state of deception. What they would believe would not be the true scripture. As a result, what we teach is that at the time of judgment, because a person had rejected the truth, they're going to undergo tremendous affliction because they have rejected the truth. They have rejected the word of God. Not, not us, we're nobody. We're just trying to present what we feel the Bible is talking about here. And most people, um, refuse to uh, acquiesce to it. But let's go on. We want to pursue a little further this concept. 
We said that there were promises in the life of the Christian who pursues the instructions, walks the path that God ordained, overcomes the things that are going to challenge him. Scripture makes certain promises to the saint who yields to the direction of the indwelling spirit. Turn to Matthew 21, Matthew 21, verses 19 to 22. Matthew 21, 19 to 22. And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. And then when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered, withered away? Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not. If you have faith and doubt not. What does that mean? That means you believe the word of God as it is presented. If you believe the word of God, you act upon the word of God as it is presented. He goes on to say, you shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also ye sh shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. Walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, being totally yielded to God, you will walk in the supernatural. What's the supernatural? Eternal life. You walk in this full level of eternal life, and as you walk in this level of eternal life, miracles will not be anything surprising. You will have the authority to perform miracles. You'll have the authority to do things on the level that Christ did things. He walked in the supernatural because he overcame all obstacles. He didn't have any problem with faith. And he was pleasing the Father. If we do that, to the level that he's doing it, we'll walk as he walked. This is the promise of the person who lives the eternal life. <clears throat> Turn to the Gospel of John, 15th chapter, verse 7. John 15, verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, it shall be done unto you. Simple. We fully commit to him. We fully pursue his word. We fully live by his word, putting his word into operation, which is godly wisdom. And whatever we ask in prayer, that's going to take place place in our life. That's a promise of living the eternal life. Now, what does Jesus, uh, what does uh, the Bible say about Christians in the end times? In the second Timothy, fourth chapter, verse three to four. Second Timothy, fourth chapter, three to four. <clears throat>
For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Who are these? The people that Jesus talked about that would listen to people that would say, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Savior, Jesus is the Messiah, and deceive them right out of their inheritance. Many, the majority of the body of Christ. Paul warns about it. He says, at the end time, they're not going to hear what you have to say. Why? Because they desire to have their own desires fulfilled more than following the desires of their spirit. They're dominated by the desires of the mind and the emotions and the intellect. Can you give an example of that? Turn to, um, well, you're in 2 Timothy, 4th chapter. Yeah, I'll give an example of that. Um, I want you to read verse 7 and 8. 2 Timothy 4. This is Paul. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. He's talking about the saint that has faithfully walked the path ordained for him. He says, I've finished my course. I've done what the Father called me to do. Now compare that, verse 9 and 10, right after what we got through reading, 9 and 10. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Having loved this present world. Why does he love his present world? Because of his emotions and desires of his intellect. The Christian has to make a decision. We've just seen two examples of that. Paul followed his spiritual desires which are after Christ. Demas followed his intellectual and emotional lusts, which are after the things of the world, the physical. Let him right away, right away to, to <coughs> betray Paul, walk away from him when you need him the most, and go off deciding a destiny that would not end well for him. Each Christian has a choice. There's a fight going on in every single one of us because we have what's called dual nature. We have a fallen nature. We have the nature we received at the time we got born again, which is the nature of Christ. Whichever nature we nur nurture, whichever nature we strengthen, that's the direction we're going to go. Judas Iscariot followed his fallen nature. Demas followed his fallen nature. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the things that your, that your senses will direct you to. The spirit will follow the path ordained by the Father because he loves the Father, he loves the Son, he loves the Holy Spirit. He will do it at the expense of his physical. That's where suffering comes in. When you deny the desires of the physical so that you can cultivate the desires of the spiritual, you're going to suffer for it physically. But you're going to grow spiritually. What is the result of all this? Turn to ending here. Jeremiah 23, verse 3 to 4. 
Jeremiah 23, verse 3 to 4. And I will gather the remnant. I will gather the remnant. The word remnant comes from a Hebrew term, sarit, which means remainder, residue, and it also means escaped. He's saying, I will gather the remnant, the remainder, the, re the, the residue, and those that escape of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, I will bring them again to their folds. They shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them. They shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. Where is this all going to lead when you put yourself under the guidance and the leadership of the Holy Spirit? It's going to lead you straight to the highest levels of eternity. Scripture teaches... They will be crafted for an existence in regions of an infinite light where life is experienced as ascending levels of light. In other words, in eternity, life is experienced by the medium of light. The Bible calls it glory. It's a splendor. It's a light in which you will live and exist and experience eternity. Each level is a degree of perfection. The highest levels are the highest states of perfection. <clears throat> Turn to 1 Timothy 6 chapter, verse 15. To the faithful, they're going to experience eternity in the highest level of light. With the highest Halloween, the Father and the Son. <clears throat> Looking at First Timothy 6, verse 15. Talking about the Lord, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. He dwells in a region in which no created being can enter. It's too glorious. The, the, the life of the creation cannot endure this intensity of light. Those who are in Christ are crafted to exist with him in this level of light. Turn to Ephesians, fourth chapter, verse 10. This is where the faithful will wind up. Sit, sit, I got it. Oh. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it up. <laughs> Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 10, closing with this. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things.
things. This is where we are going to wind up with him in a level of light that no created being can enter into. But he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you with me that you might behold my glory. We're going to be seated with him in this place we call Eparanios. It's the highest state. It cannot be defined. Matter of fact, the scripture attempts to define it. Turn to Ephesians 4.10. We'll close with this. Ephesians 4.10. Uh, no, excuse me, we just read that. Uh, Ephesians 1. 20 to 21. Sorry. Ephesians 1, 20 to 21. <coughs> Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Far above, far above, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. In other words, it's in a place you cannot define, you cannot name it. It is so glorious and so splendid, it can't be described. It can't be explained. It can only be experienced by that small group that has been <coughs> crafted to exist there with the Creator. This is what we are desiring to make our destiny. Mr. Smith. Okay, so it can't be spoke of, can't be described. Uh, okay, but when you arrive in the heavenly realms, Imagining that you've qualified for that indeed, will you be able to describe, teach, or talk about? It's a region in which. You talking about Eperonios? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. It's a region in which no creation, it's not for the creation, it's for the Creator. I'm understanding recently that it can only be experienced. You yes. can't explain it to somebody else. No. You who can comprehend it. No. Those two who are in Ekranos experience Ekranos, so there's no need to discuss anything. Well, they don't... Those who are not in Ekranos, how are you going to say something? It's not for explanation. Agreed, and I'm saying, mm. if you try to explain it, which of course you wouldn't, but if you did try to explain it, you couldn't. No. There's no, there's no they try here yeah. in the scripture. And they come up saying, it's undefinable. You cannot, not only from a human perspective, from an angelic perspective, they cannot define it. It's above all heavens, above the creation. It is the dwelling of the creator himself, which fills the rest of the creation. It can't contain him. And this is his residence, if you will. And we, praise God, have been, because of his favor, ordained that one day we will join him in this Epioranos region, which makes anything we can undergo in this life worth it. <laughs>